be a lie because he's not perfect. But that way, at least he could save face and the people around him could think, this man really is godly. Bottom line, the lawyer, like so many of us, wants to get by with following Christ by putting forth as little commitment as possible. Just enough to get by. Look at the next slide. C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. There's no casual approach to it. If you are thinking of being a Christian, I warn you, you are embarking on something that is going to take the whole of you. So then we have the priest and the Levite. These guys represent the ultimate insiders. They're the church folk. They're the church leaders. They're the staff. So they've been doing their thing, keeping things rocking along at the temple in Jerusalem. The priest was kind of the head guy. Levite was kind of like of an assistant. These characters represent those who are very much at home inside the church, but are embarrassingly ineffective outside of the church. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, both men had been near God, but were nothing like him. When I was a youth pastor, many, many times, you know, we would come together either as our group on a Wednesday night or we would go somewhere to some big conference. Oh, boy, the, the, we would sing with passion. We'd lift the hands. We'd get on our knees. We'd listen to the scriptures. We'd nod. We'd do everything right. But I would tell them all the time, I would exhort them, look, if what we're doing inside here makes no different outside of here, we're totally wasting our time and we're nothing but hypocrites. And so that's why my prayer is that today we might look at this story that is so familiar to us and that the Holy Spirit may break our hearts all over again so that when we leave this place, all of a sudden, we become that good neighbor. Brennan Manning died a few years ago, but he was a recovering alcoholic. He said this about hypocrisy. Look at that next slide. He said, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyles. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, let me give this one note. Jesus is not asking his listeners here to be foolish. If you're driving later tonight while it's dark down a dirt road and there's some guy standing with his thumb out wearing a hockey mask and carrying an axe, you don't stop and say, get in because Jesus said I should invite you <laughs> and give you, you be a good neighbor. Jesus is simply making a point. Don't be foolish. So finally, I just want to uh, say this. I want to look at this from the perspective of the beat-up man. The traveler beaten to a pulp and in need of a neighbor. We've all at one time or another been beaten to a pulp and in need of a neighbor, right? I and mean, we've been down, we've been lonely, we've been hurt, we've been in pain. I remember in 1979 when I was going into 11th grade, 79, man, disco was king. Yes, yes. Come on with your bad self. I just pulled a hamstring. But I remember, uh, let's see, I just turned 16. My mother and father had been divorced. My dad was in a drunken rage. Came over to our house. He kicked our door in so hard, it came, the frame came out of the sheetrock. We had to sleep in different homes that night in Abilene because we didn't have a front door. We were desperately in need of a neighbor. The following day, men from our church came over and replaced the door painted it. It was like it never happened. In May of 2013, uh, my son, as you will know, took his life. He was 19 years old. We were in desperate need of a neighbor, and this church became somewhat of a spiritual ER and ICU unit, and even to this day is helping us uh, heal. But I want to refer back to another time when my family was in great pain, when we were the traveler beaten up to a pulp and in desperate need of a neighbor. It was 2003, and we, had, we were suffering from a, 
a humiliating job loss. I, I, I just was about to lose my mind. I didn't know who I was anymore. I was depressed. I was discouraged. I was angry. I'd hit rock bottom. That was August of 2003. School began. Macy was, I think, six. Jordan was 10. Kelsey was 12. So I dropped them off at school on that first morning of, of school and, and didn't know what to do after that. Where do I go? What do I do? I, I was in between jobs at the time. I, I was embarrassed. I was hurt. I was... Uh, it was a horrible, horrible time. Plus... I hadn't shaved in several days. I think I was wearing the same clothes I'd worn three days in a row. I, I, it, it was an absolute mess. Somehow, some way, I ended up at a little coffee shop at the corner of 82nd and Slide called Aromas. It's not there anymore. I wish it was. Uh, but I tell you what, I felt absolutely horrible when I walked in there. There's a professor. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. His name is Louis Smeeds. He said this. Look at this next slide. He said, what I felt most was a glob of unworthiness. What I needed was a sense that God accepted me, owned me, held me, affirmed me, and would never let go of me, even if he was not too much impressed with what he had on his hands. And so I stumbled into that coffee shop and <laughs> was met by neighbors in a most unlikely place. The barista the, behind the counter, he was your typical surfer dude. He was from California, had long blonde hair, very nice looking. He was probably in his early 20s. And when I walked in there, man, I, I was just at rock bottom. But he just treated me incredible. With great dignity and respect, he lifted my spirits immediately. And uh, it was just an amazing thing. In time, God brought other people into that coffee shop who did the same thing. It became somewhat of a church for me. It was so weird. It reminds me of the story I heard an evangelist tell one time. He said he went into a church uh, to preach one night and no one talked to him. Uh, it was just, uh, I mean, it was just as cold as ice in there. Nobody really responded. When he left, no one talked to him. Hardly anybody smiled. He said afterward, he went to the Denny's down the street. Boy, the hostess there greeted him, gave him a big hug, called him honey sat him down, gave him a cup of coffee. What else do you want? He had an awesome time. He said, after the night, I thought if I had a choice between joining, joining that church and joining the Denny's, I would have joined the Denny's. <laughs> you ever been in like that? Well, I'll tell you what, if I could have joined Aromas, I would. In fact, I really kind of did. It was an awesome, awesome place. And so in hindsight, as I thought about myself as, that, as, as the traveler beaten to a pulp and in need of a neighbor and how God met me uh, through those people in that place. I just thought that sort of represents for me uh, characteristics of what a neighbor is. And so I used that name aromas as an acrostic to come up with how a neighbor might be described. Go to that next slide. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. And so we use this word aroma, and I knew I needed to come up, I, want, I needed to start it with love. And so what's a word for love that starts with an A? Ah, I didn't know, so go to the next slide. I borrowed from the Italians. <clears throat> you look in Jesus' story in Luke 10, it says, when he saw him, when the Samaritan saw him, he took pity on him. He loved the man. He showed compassion on him, didn't he? Paul wrote to the Romans, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. I remind you every week during the greeting time, Jesus' words on the night before he was crucified. He said, by this, all people will know if you follow me. What? If you love one another. It's just pretty simple. But then again, it's not simple at all, is it? Keith Green, the uh, probably no other musician, had a greater impact on me than Keith Green. You need to Google him sometime. Incredible pianist, incredible pianist, songwriter, a modern-day prophet. The Lord took him home back in 1982. But before he was saved, he said, before, he said, before I was saved, the one thing that kept me away from Christ 
was Christians. Chuck Swindoll once said, I am a Christian, but if I were not, the one thing that would keep me from becoming one are the words and actions of Christians toward one another. Love one another. Love your neighbor. It all starts there. Next slide. So what does the R stand for? Well, for me, it stood for rest, and here's what I mean by that. The Samaritan put the beaten man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. He just took away the man's burden. Jesus put it this way. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest, and you'll find rest for your souls. Listen, there's so many people who are burdened by different things in life, worries and stress. I remember when Macy was in kindergarten, every day when I would go pick her up, she's sassy anyway, she has this attitude a mile wide, and she'd come out, her little sneakers and her overalls, and she, you know, now they have those backpacks. Back, back when I was in school, oh, we didn't carry backpacks. I don't know what we did. Anyway, this was a long time ago. But anyway, she'll come out, and the first thing she'd do every day is, Dad, take this. <laughs> All she want to do is get rid of that load. And you know what? That's what beaten up travelers want as well. Man, please, please take my load. They are in need of a neighbor, and they're carrying enormous burdens. We can't carry their pain, but we know the one who can. There was a former youth who called me just last week. She called me about another issue, but as we talked, and I haven't talked to this, this girl in a long, long time, did her wedding a few years back. She lives out of state now, but the more we talked, the more she just began to open up, began to talk about how far away from God she feels now, and she's not been uh, doing the right things. And, you know, I could have said, well, you should be. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, girl, you need to lay those burdens down. Put them on the shoulders of Jesus. They're broad enough to handle that. Last week, I had a garage repairman come to my house because the garage broke and it was crooked and I couldn't get the car out. And so fortunately, he was able to come by. Now, at the end, when he was done, I asked him, I said, now, I think I've used you before. He sa I said, but your, the name of your company was different. He said, I know, I know. He said, after 24 years of marriage, I went through a divorce and had to change the name. Now, he didn't have to say that. He could have just as easily said, you know what? Yeah, I had to change the name. He didn't have to reveal anything. Immediately, I sensed this guy, man, he is carrying a burden. Went in to write a check to pay him, came back out and said, man, are you okay? Let me pray for you. You're going to be all right. Man, there are people everywhere just who are beaten up. They're loaded down with guilt and shame, and they just need to know that with Christ, that with a neighbor, that there is rest. And this Samaritan gave that man rest. So the O, move right through this. Next slide. Open. Here's what I mean by that. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds. As I stated earlier, the Jews hated, hated the Samaritans for a number of reasons, and I, I don't have time to go into those right now. You can easily look that up on your own. One chapter earlier, there, as I said, Jesus and, and his disciples are heading down from Galilee, and, and they're heading toward Jerusalem. And so they actually, in Luke 9, he records it, they tried to stop in a Samaritan village. The Samaritan said, no, you're not stopping here, you're Jews. I mean, th there was great hostility between the Jews and Samaritan. In fact, James and John, two of the disciples, asked Jesus if he would just nuke them, just zap them right off the face of the earth. Of course, Jesus rebuked them. I tell you what, there's... What I'm trying to say is you have to be open to that person who is in need. They might not be like you. You know what? They might have deserved to be where they are. Inevitably, you're going to come across someone who needs help that you don't feel like helping. Maybe you don't like something about it. Anne Lamott, next uh, slide, please. She's an incredible Christian author. She said, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> so the M, next slide. We have the love, the rest, being open, knowing that there is no such thing as a non-neighbor. And then me, here's what I mean by that. 
In Luke 10, 33, it says, and when the Samaritan saw him. What a tender, gentle, and poignant phrase. The priest and the Levite saw him, but they didn't see him, did they? In the MSNBC uh, illustration I shared earlier in the show, What Would You Do? These people see these people hurting, but they don't really see them doing One author said, how can one be a good neighbor? It takes eyes and ears to be a good neighbor. And sure, it's easy to notice those who are poor and the down and out, the people we see them every week standing on the busy corners at the intersections of the loop and major intersections, holding the cardboard sign, says, hungry, need help. Anything helps, God bless you. But when's the last time you noticed your spouse? or your children, or your boss, or your employees, or those closest to you. Too often we tend to look too far down the road when the traveler beaten to a pulp and in need of a neighbor may be living in your very same house as you do. Although it may be easy to identify some who are in need, one can be bloodied and bruised without ever showing a single outward bruise or injury. Many of us, right after this is over, are going to grab a bite at a restaurant. And we're going to go in there and there's going to be a server and there's going to be a host and, or, you know, maybe it's just the person behind the counter at Burger King. It doesn't matter. But you just never know who's fighting a battle, do you? We were at On the Border just last week and I tell you what, this poor guy, he was young and uh, looked college age, and he was struggling doing. We didn't care. I mean, we, we, were, we were easy going. But he was so afraid that we were going to be upset. In fact, told us another table was very upset with him. He's your neighbor as well. So we continue. I needed this thing to open with love and end with love. And so I needed another word, a word, for love. Oh, so I borrowed from the Bible. Go ahead, Jarrett, next slide. Yes, it's agape. <clears throat> the Greek word for love, it's the word used in John 3, 16, for God so loved agape the world he gave his only son. Look at the next slide. John wrote, we love because he first loved us, and he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Again, love for our neighbor is not optional. Well, on aromas, the word has an S on the end. It's possessive. So I thought I better use a word for this S as well. Next slide. And the word I chose was safe. There is a passage in John chapter 8 about the woman caught in adultery. And I always wonder, what about the guy? But they just got the woman here. And you know the story. They took her, and they threw her out in the open, and they were about to kill her. In fact, John 8, 3 says, the teachers of the law, next slide, and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. Now, you let that sink in for a moment. As you consider yourself being a good neighbor, are you a safe neighbor? Are you going to share confidential details with somebody else? Or are you a safe place to go? You know, Baptists don't gossip, we share prayer requests. <laughs> you know that's right, don't you? <laughs> oh, have you heard about Jenny? She did this and this and this. Oh, we really need to pray for her. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. These are several characteristics that I learned about a good neighbor when I was that traveler beaten to a pulp and in need of a neighbor. Let me conclude by saying this. Let's just return to the question that prompted Jesus' story. Who is my neighbor? Folks, it's anyone in need. It's anyone who needs you or needs me. Now, the danger here today is to leave here, take a good look around, and seeing the mass amount of hurt and pain in this world, we become overwhelmed. 
And so, seeing that we can't change everything, we become discouraged and indifferent and end up doing nothing. But that reminds me of the very familiar story. It's been around a while. It's the man walking down the ocean, uh, the beach, and there are uh, starfish that have washed up on shore, and they're going to dry out and they're going to die unless someone throws them back in the ocean. Well, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And so here he is, just picking up a starfish, throwing it back in the ocean. Picking up a starfish, throwing it back in the ocean. A guy coming the other way, approaches him, asks him what he's doing. He tells him, and he says, look how many starfish there are. What do you think you're doing? What difference is this going to make? The man reached down, picked up a starfish, said, you know what? It matters to this one. As you go out this week, God is going to bring across your path a traveler beaten to a pulp and in need of a neighbor. May we give off an aroma of what Jesus describes a good neighbor to be. Perhaps you're here today and you're a traveler in need of a neighbor, but on an entirely different level. You don't nearly, merely need a neighbor, you need a savior. Like the beaten man in the story, we're helpless and in need of the ultimate neighbor. Christ left his throne in heaven, took on the form of a servant, paid our debt by giving his life on the cross, and then through his resurrection offers us healing, peace, joy, and eternal life. And if you'll let him, he'll pick you up, tend your wounds, and make you whole. Jesus died that Friday on a hillside outside of Jerusalem. I can hear Satan hissing to him. Look at the mass of humanity. What a waste of your love. Many of those people that you died for will reject you. What does it even matter? And Jesus looked at you and at me and he said, it matters to this one. Jesus asked the lawyer, he said, which one of these people was a neighbor to the man who was beaten? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. To which Jesus finally said, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and thank you for the opportunity just to gather together and study your word.